We may be few, and our enemies many. Yet so long as there remains one of us still fighting, one who still rages in the name of justice and truth, then by the All Father, the galaxy shall yet know hope. Looking to support the Amber King channel? Fenris Workshop are offering a fantastic deal on their wargaming products. Looking to elevate the story and detail of your miniatures? Check out their amazing Dirty Down Effects paint. Bring the decay and rust of the grim dark future to your miniatures. And for those looking to save money, Fenris Workshop's Order of the Stormcaller's Loyalty Program offers a fantastic range of rewards. Cash back, loot bags of different sizes, exclusive merch, and special products, all for buying the equipment you need. Use my link in the description to begin your journey. Paints, basing materials, miniatures, and so much more are all available at FenrisWorkshop.com. Thank you so much, Fenris Workshop, for sponsoring this video. It matters not how high your walls soar. It matters not how many will answer your call. It matters not how keen your blade glimmers, nor how bright burns your hearth fire. The wolf waits. The wolf waits in darkness for us all. We are the wolf that stalks the cold skies and swallows the star fire. We are the hidden in the darkness when the light has gone. Our light is within us. We run the ruin of fire in the darkness. Foes burn in our passing. Hidden in the darkness, when the light has gone, with sharp fangs and the fury of the Allfather, Wolf Lord Ragnar Blackmane of the Space Wolves chapter battles against the threat that humanity faces. The young king, the Black Wolf, the youngest wolf lord in the chapter's history is a name whispered as one of the greatest champions of humanity. But who is the man, Ragnar? Who is the person behind the mythological status? His story begins in the 40th millennium, in Segmentum Solar, on the world of Fenris, a young boy with thick dark hair and a hardened frame stared up to look at a creature of nightmare. A giant sea serpent lashed out towards the boy and the wooden boat full of his tribe's warriors. Fear gripped all of their hearts. Their hands were trembling as the violent sea storm rattled their vessel. As the grown men around him hesitated, the young boy grabbed a spear and lunged it at the creature, piercing its enormous eye. Its hit was true that this only seems to have enraged the sea demon. Despite being young, the boy knew to die here would have been a good death. The greatest dream for any amongst the primitive tribes of Fenris. Booming laughter came from the prow of the ship. The sorcerer, the giant man with fangs in strange armor who had hired his father's vessel, laughed. As the rain and thunder rang in the boy's ears, the giant man pulled a metallic talisman from his side and unleashed his magic, exploding the sea demon's head. They had survived. The seas calmed, and they took the sorcerer to his destination. The boy began to ask the sorcerer questions. His curiosity overcame his superstitions and fear. He wondered if the giant was a sky warrior, one who fought in the heavens alongside the Allfather and the legendary Lehman Russ. He asked the giant if they would ever meet again, and the sorcerer told Ragnar he hoped that they never would, because that would be a day of doom. Fenris, a world of ice, titanic oceans, 
violent volcanoes and mountains that touched the heavens, home to grueling winters and summers choked with lava and ash as the very world itself was a danger to humanity. As if the freezing temperatures were not enough, creatures and monsters roamed and dwelled amongst the ice and violent seas. Trolls, serpents, and wolves so large you would be frozen in fear when their predatory gaze fell upon you. It would be on this frozen hellscape that the boy Ragnar of the Thunderfist tribe would be born. Life for a mortal man and woman on Fenris is a grueling, primitive experience. The violent and turbulent geology of the world meant that solid stone structures were impossible. It was a nomadic life, where the idea of permanence was a luxury. It was sacred. The young child Ragnar lost his mother very young, and so it'd be the boy's father who would be the only parent he ever knew. Ragnar began to train. Life on Fenris was brutal, and only the strongest survived. Hunting and fighting was everyday life, and at night the tribe would gather around their scold, the keeper of the memories. The great sagas would be sung, the stories of the Allfather and his son Lehman Russ, songs about the demon Horus and the great warriors of old. In a life that was fraught with danger and instability, being immortalized in the sagas was a dream for everyone, and even some could be worthy to join the Sky Warriors and fight amongst the heavens by Russ's side, to live forever in the songs and the heart of the people. To have achieved a warrior's death was everything. Who are we without our stories? Ragnar grew over the years witnessing death and battle at a young age. To live long enough to have grey hairs was a rarity in the tribes of Fenris. Ragnar battled, hunted, and sailed the lands near his home, even meeting the strange giant sorcerer named Ranek, an experience he would never forget. To have met one of the legendary Sky Warriors was a miracle in of itself. Ragnar grew from that boy who challenged the sea demon into a man, a warrior of the Thunderfist tribe. It was a time for celebration, a moment he shared with his friends who he grew up with, and the woman he had grown to love. But nothing lasts forever, not on Fenris. The Grim Skulls. The Thunderfist rival tribe attacked them in the midst of the celebration. Ragnar had completed the ritual of manhood only days before, and he looked to the woman he loved, Anna, and he mourned the life they could have had together, and then he headed out for war. The slaughter was fierce, skulls broke, limbs severed, and roars swelled in the night's air. The people Ragnar had shared his life with, the people who he had played, grown, and listened to the sagas with, were dying. The battle raged under the snow and starlight, until a strange light shone from the sky. The two sides dispersed, and a giant sorcerer emerged onto the field. Ragnar recognized him immediately. The day of doom had come. Ragnar, the Thunderfists, and the Grim Skulls picked up their weapons and launched at each other. A glorious death awaited. You are back among the living, laddie. He said it wasn't a question. Am I? Are you not one of the choosers of the slain? The old man's booming laughter echoed out over the rubble. Several distant figures turned to look at him as if startled. Always questions, eh? You haven't changed much, boy. I am not a boy. I gained the robe of manhood days ago. And what days they were, eh? Well... You distinguished yourself on the field of battle. I'll say that for you. You're a fighter, laddie. I haven't seen such carnage since the time of Berek and that was... Well, that was a long time ago. So you are a chooser then? Yes, laddie, that I am. But not in the sense you think. Then in what sense are you one? Surely you either are or you are not. One day, 
One day, if you live, you will understand. The universe is not nearly so simple as you believe. You will find this out soon enough. If I live. Ragnar looked down in wonder at where the wounds in his chest should have been. Surely you have already been dead? Is that what you were going to say? Yes, you were. Dead, or the next best thing to it. Your heart had stopped beating and you had lost a lot of blood. Your body took a lot of damage, but not enough. Our healer got to you before brain death could occur, and what ailed you was not beyond the power of our magic to fix. Ragnar was sure he had muttered another word before he said magic, but he had never heard the word before, and it made no sense. But that was only to be expected of wizards. They spoke in riddles and nonsense. Still, his words gave Ragnar hope. You can bring back the dead, then my father... Your father is beyond our aid, laddie. Ranek said. He gestured towards the distant fires. Why didn't you help him? When you helped me, you could have done it. He had not proved himself worthy of our aid or our interest. You have. You have been chosen, laddie. Chosen for what? You'll find out soon enough if that is your destiny. The old man showed his fangs in that disturbing smile. Now you belong to the wolves. Body and soul, you belong to the wolves. Ragnar raised himself to his feet, unsteady as a newborn kid. He tried to put one foot in front of the other to walk, but he found himself reeling and staggering. Almost at once, he overbalanced and the ground rose to meet him. He was slammed into the earth with painful force. He did not let it stop him. Pushing against the ground with both hands, he rose to his feet once more. This time he managed a few more steps, and before he could fall, he stopped himself and stood upright. Swaying, he felt nauseous, his stomach churned, he felt dreadful, but at the same time he felt a huge sense of relief. He was not dead. He was among the living. For whatever mysterious reasons they might have, Ranek and his fellows had chosen to spare him. Indeed, it appeared that in some way they had chosen him, though it was not quite like any of the hero tales he had heard. Still, he had been picked out. They were mighty mages indeed. They had healed his wounds. They had brought him back from the dead. Or had they? Was this some kind of foul sorcery such as the demons were said to practice? Had they taken his soul and bound it into his corpse using dark wizardry? Would his body soon begin to rot and decompose? He turned to face the wolf priest. Am I dead? He asked. It was an insane question. He knew, but Ranek looked at him with what appeared to be understanding, perhaps even sympathy. As far as those people down there are concerned, yes, laddie. You are among the slain. You will depart from this place never to return. Your destiny lies elsewhere now, among the endless ice, and perhaps among the stars. Ragnar thought he saw Anna being pushed out onto one of the dragon ships. Suddenly he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he had to get to her. He began to move towards the beach, staggering like a drunkard. He half expected Ranek to try and stop him, but the wolf priest let him go. Ragnar had no idea how long it took him to reach the beach. He knew that when he got there he was panting as hard as if he had run 20 miles over sand. He saw the Grimskull warriors all turn and look at him. There was wonder on their faces and horror. They had made the sign of Russ over their breasts and continued to wade out into the sea and clamber aboard their ships. Ragnar tried to follow them, but the waves beat against him and he fell. The water closed over his head and began to fill his lungs. He rose to his feet and started to splutter. He tried to push on out once more, but a powerful hand closed on his shoulder. He turned around and swiftly lashed out with his fist. Agony shot up his arm, and it felt as if he might have broken his fingers. Ceramite will not yield to naked flesh, laddie, Ranek said. 
lifting him as easily as if he were a puppy, despite his struggles. You'll only break your hands if you keep that up. Out onto the water, the drums had begun to beat. Oars splashed into the water. The dragon ships began to pull away from the land. Where are we going? They are returning to their homes with their new chattels, laddie. They will not live here now. After the battle, they believe this island will be haunted. I imagine that your seeming resurrection will only give credence to that viewpoint. This will be a sacred sight before long. Of that, I have no doubt. And then they will forget. Men always forget. The battle was over. Ragnar's home, seeded with ash and blood, burned. The life he knew, the life he could have had, was gone. He awoke. His mortal injuries healed by the sorcerer Rannek and his entourage. Ragnar had fought like a man possessed. Something wrathful and dangerous was buried deep within his soul. And the warriors of the Grimskull tribe fell in their dozens to his axes as he roared with the fire of his life's fading light. Twenty men were torn down by his blades, until another youth of a similar age caught his eye. Sturbjorn of the Grimskull's eyes met his. Two hate-filled predatory eyes waiting for a kill. With his axe still wet with the blood of Ragnar's father, Styrbjorn launched himself at the Thunderfist, each dealing a mortal blow. As the dust settled and the grim skulls were victorious, Ragnar awoke, resurrected from the glorious death he had earned. You can imagine the despair he must have felt, seeing his home destroyed, the love of his life taken away, and the sight of his fallen father, the only parent he had ever known, and then the hate. When Ragnar saw Stybjorn also healed by Ranek, the Grim Skull scum who had killed his father, the wolf waits. The wolf waits in the darkness for us all. Ragnar attempted to end the Grim Skull there and then, but Ranek stopped him. Just as Ragnar had been chosen, so had Stybjorn. The Sky Warriors had come. They had the potential to join the Allfather and Russ in the Oververse, the heavens, and fight amongst the stars. The two tribal warriors, healed of their wounds, were taken by Ranek, soaring high in the sky in a bird made of metal, an almost dizzying sight compared to the primitive existence Ragnar had known. Was he dead? Was this the reward for the glorious dead promised to those on Fenris? The thought raced through Ragnar's mind. The fascination and confusion overwhelming his grief. Arriving on the only stable continent on Fenris, they landed in the village of Rusvik. The solid structures seeming like a luxury. Ragnar, Stybjorn and dozens of others were assembled in the freezing snow. A giant man strode forward, just as tall as Ranek. Hakon was his name, and a thunderous voice shook Ragnar to his call. All assembled had been chosen. They had all shown their strength. But this meant nothing. The worst was yet to come. For those who are strong enough, they will be worthy to join Hakon's Brotherhood. They could join the Wolves and fight the enemies of the Allfather in the stars. Ragnar, strong enough to kill a dozen men, a man who had the spirit to challenge the sea demon would face his greatest challenge. Their training begun. Grueling physical workouts, dangerous mountain treks, survival skills and hand-to-hand -hand combat was drilled into Ragnar and the other aspirants. Their fingers bled, their bodies ached, their minds were challenged by the constant need of willpower and determination. Ragnar's excitement began to grow. The adventure that lay ahead, the chance to join the great warriors of the Allfather, 
To cement his name in history was a dream pumped into every son of Fenris since birth. He could be part of the sagas, his name sung for millennia. But something else gnawed at the back of the young warrior's mind. Hate. Stybjorn. Allocated into the same group, Ragnar had begun to make friends with the others, such as Kjell, Lars, Nils, and Sven. Other aspirants taken from across the world, but that cold, uncompromising desire to end the Grimskull plagued his thoughts. Perhaps a time would come soon. Even being forced into life and death situations with Stybjorn, no bond had been created between them. Each of them burned with the same hatred they saw on the day Ragnar's former life had been destroyed. This new existence had made it seem that Ragnar's previous life, his love, his father, his village, it all seemed to fall further and further away from him. But perhaps that hate for Stybjorn kept him tied to it, to them, and losing that inner fire meant losing them too. Many aspirants died over the coming weeks, even one from Ragnar's own group, bitten in half by a monstrous troll. A sense of guilt washed over him. He had been chosen as the leader, and it was his responsibility to protect the group, a feeling his mentor Hakon sympathized with. It was never easy to lose a brother, and if Ragnar was to survive this path, he would lose many more. The thought of losing his friend Kjell and the others filled him with dread. It was weeks of near-death experiences, grueling physical trials, but those aspirants who had survived emerged hardened, refined, the apex of mortal men. They were ready. Their bodies had been tested, but what about their heart, their soul? As Hakon congratulated the passing aspirants, he told Ragnar and the others that everything up to now had been easy. Now would be the true test, the last hurdle before brotherhood, and the chance to join Russ's chosen. Ragnar, Stybjorn, Lars, Nils and Sven headed towards the Fang, the heart and home of the Space Wolves chapter. It was unlike anything Ragnar had ever seen. Even the small wooden stone village of Rusvik was incredible to him, but a fortress the size of a mountain, carved with the intricate designs, stones shaped from the time of Rus. It was more than most on Fenris could ever dream of, and to the aspirants they sent words of praise to the Allfather. Perhaps they really were in the Oververse, in heaven. But there was little time to appreciate the wonders of the place. Ranek, the giant who Ragnar had met as a boy and who had brought him back to the land of the living was waiting for them. Down the aspirants descended, deep into the fortress, to the gates of Morkai. Behold the gate of Morkai, through it lies the path to death or glory. Beyond this there is no return save as one worthy to belong to the wolves in body and soul. Ragnar could feel power thrum from the runes of the archway. Nervous, but determined, Ragnar strode forward, each step becoming heavier until all space and time seemed to shift around him. Four voices laughed around him. As he began to see visions, he did not know who or what these creatures were. Ragnar was shown great battles, himself suited in grey armour, victorious. The twisted, seductive whispers offered him anything he desired. Glory for the barbarian, concubines, power, all gifts the proud Thunderfist spurned. But then the most tempting of all was offered up to him. Stybjorn. Vengeance. The voices screamed for him to slay the Grim Skull, avenge his people, let the hate flow. The wolf waits, the wolf waits in the darkness for us all. But worst of all, he wanted it. Ragnar had been dreaming day and night for weeks about ending the scum. His vision blurred, 
The blade now placed in his hands trembled. His most inner self was being ripped open. At the edge of claiming his vengeance, he screamed in rage. He would not be coerced. He would not be manipulated. The proud scion of the Thunder Fist would not fall down this path. I am Ragnar, and I defy you. He awoke. Some of the other aspirants lay near him, dead. Ranek told him that no one had ever come closer to failing than him. Ragnar was strong, capable and honorable, but his hate for Stybjorn had almost killed him. It was a simplistic, tribal hate, a remnant of mortal rivalry, and if Ragnar wanted to survive, he had to let it go. The hardest thing in this world is to let go of hate, a struggle that most of us will never conquer. Ragnar, Stybjorn, Kjell, Lars, Nils and Sven had survived. Their souls were worthy, and now came the final trial. The cup of the Wolfen. It was the mark of Rus. They were to drink from its contents and to bind the power of Rus to themselves. They would become faster, stronger, and sturdier than any mortal man if they lived. But if evil lay in their heart, they wouldn't join the Chosen. They would become monsters, Wolfen. Creatures of nightmare who haunted the skulled songs of Ragnar's youth. One by one, the surviving aspirants, now only a handful, drank. Ragnar dreaded it. Would his hate for Stybjorn kill him now? He drank, feeling nothing. Then hours later it begun. The fever, the sickness, the feral rage. His body was screaming. Ragnar could feel himself turning. He was becoming something more than human. His muscles grew, his canines lengthened. His senses were sharpened to a level that would frighten us. His mind screamed, remember who you are, Ragnar. Control yourself. Something within had been awoken. A wolf, ready to lash out, ready to tear any who stood in front of him. After days, the aspirants began to adapt. Some had died. Ragnar looked over, and his friend Kiel looked haunted. He could see that the others were a mix of barely controlled feral instincts. The genetics of Rus, the Canis Helix had been bound to them. And for those who had survived, the last trial began. Thrown into the freezing wastes outside the Fang, the aspirants were ordered to journey back. They were to battle the cold, the monsters, and the wolf inside. Ragnar alone began his great journey, trudging through the snow, hunting and gathering just like his time at Rusvik, even coming face to face with an injured great Fenrisian wolf, two predators meeting eye to eye. With his newfound strength, Ragnar slew the great beast skinning its black mane to use for warmth. There was a certain peace to this existence. For a long time, Ragnar had not been alone. He hadn't thought about home, the life he had. He did not have to return. He could live on these slopes forever, a free man. But something called to him. This desire was not for glory, but for brotherhood. The chance to be a part of something bigger than himself. The last Thunderfist found his resolve and headed towards his destiny, but something was wrong. After a few hours, Ragnar with his new senses noticed he was being watched. He was being hunted. I am a forest and a night of dark trees. But he who is not afraid of my darkness will find banks full of roses under my cypresses. Whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster. And if you gaze long enough into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. 
piercing yellow eyes peered through the blizzard. It was the abyss staring back. The feral beast that lurked inside Ragnar, fighting for control. A wolfen. Whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster. This was the final test, to bind the ferocity of the Canix Helix and control the inner beast. But what stood before Ragnar was one who had lost that battle. The nightmarish monster of the Skald's tales. The beast lunged forward, moving faster than any mortal man. But Ragnar was ready. With his improved senses and reflexes, he plunged his makeshift spear deep into the beast's chest. Slammed backwards, the monster met Ragnar's eyes. He saw a sadness within that feral gaze, and the beast uttered a single word. Ragnar. As the corpse slumped to the ground, he looked closer, and he howled with rage and grief. The monster was Kiel, his only friend left in the universe. To see what had become of someone he cared about, and then having to take their life, would be a pain that would haunt him forever. So much had been sacrificed. Family, friends, his body and mind. But Ragnar had to finish it. It was his indomitable will that had brought him this far. And it was why he was worthy and he would see it to the end. Ragnar trudged again through the freezing blizzard, all the way to the steps of the Fang. A muscular silhouette with a black mane of fur on his shoulders. He made it. Ragnar awoke from the cold steel table. He had been cut open. New organs were placed inside. The pain was unbearable. Gene seed crafted from the genetics of Russ were joined to him. In a way, he was part god. The wonder and excitement of being connected to the Allfather must have been overwhelming. Fighting through the sensations of pain, fresh off the cold surgery table, the surviving aspirants, Ragnar, Stybjorn, Lars, Nils and Sven had the crown of knowledge placed upon their heads, and their lives would change forever. Information flooded into his brain. They were the Space Wolves, the defenders of humanity, serving in the Imperium of Man, the Emperor of Mankind, the Allfather, crippled upon his golden throne on terror, ruled over one million worlds. He learned of Lehman Russ, the man. He learned how to speak Imperial Gothic, how their technology worked. He learned the truth about the demon Horus and the great heresy, the four chaos gods and their vile names, the ones who had tempted him at the gate of Morkai. He learned more about his own transformation how his body and mind had been fundamentally changed. His senses were heightened. His strength was incredible. His thoughts became focused. The mortal man, the primitive tribal warrior Ragnar, was dead. Who he was now was Ragnar the Space Wolf. Only five had made it. Unfortunately for Ragnar, the scum Stybjorn had survived. The hate was still there. The snarling wolf inside his soul desired to rip him apart. It would be something Ragnar had to learn to control for the battles to come. Ragnar had trained his body and tested his spirit, but now was the time to put it to use. Deep below the fang, the newly designated blood claws began their training. The sorcery in Ragnar's primitive youth had become cold, hard science. The bolt gun and grenades were his tool now. The blood core pack trained for days on end, their new physiology giving them astounding endurance. Environments Ragnar had never seen or even dreamt of became grueling exercise grounds. With the gene seed of rust within them, the new space wolves began to exhibit more changes. Their sense of smell became so keen that they could sense each other's emotions. A level of unspoken understanding began to spread throughout the group. There could be no lies between brothers now. All were connected like a pack. 
something Ragnar found comfort in, that desire for brotherhood that had drawn him to join their ranks, perhaps also alleviated the grief he had felt over the past months. But their transformation into Astartes would not be enjoyed for long. Ragnar's pack, Stybjorn, Lars, Nils and Sven were sent to investigate a missing pack of blood claws on Fenris. Travelling deep into a dark and damp cave system, they were horrified to discover a shrine of chaos. It was a trap. Booming laughter emerged from the dark as Maddox, a thousand sun sorcerer, had new toys to play with. He was tainted. The smell and taste in the air disgusted Ragnar. This was the ancient enemy, Chaos. It was a slaughter. Space Wolf bodies began to fall like flies, with only Ragnar, Stybion, Sven and two others escaping. Fighting their way out, they were almost overwhelmed. Ragnar's great journey would end after he had just begun. As Ragnar saw death approach, it would be Stybjorn who saved him. Feelings of confusion washed over him, as moments later the Grimskull suffered a crippling blow. He could let him die. Finally the scum would be gone. The thought floated in Ragnar's head. But honor won out. Ragnar sent Sven and the others ahead. He would wait with Stybjorn for reinforcements. Ragnar swallowed his hate and pushed it down. Brotherhood came first. As the two limped to the surface, the laughter rose again. The smell of taint pierced their souls. Maddox. There will be no more running now. A fierce duel broke out. Ragnar was outmatched, barely holding on. But with the intervention of the wounded Stybjorn, Ragnar rammed his chainsaw into the sorcerer's faceplate, howling in triumph. They had survived and achieved a feat remarkable for a blood claw, but the time to rest would not be long. The next battle's foundations had been set as the Imperial Inquisition arrived. And how long precisely will that be? Kara Isan glared at him with cat like green eyes. She was almost as tall as he was brown skin with a pert nose and wide lips. Her hair was lustrous black. She was the most exotic woman he had ever seen, but right at this moment there was nothing remotely attractive about her. I can see why you are an Inquisitor, Ragnar replied. And once again, you are avoiding giving me an answer. The answer is plain, lady. I don't know. I am not an archivist. I am only here to be your guide. And to be our watchdog. Ragnar looked at her, startled that she would suggest such a thing. In that tone of voice, it was close to being an insult. Those are words I would call out for if- If I were a man. Ragnar almost smiled. That was exactly what he was going to say. The women folk of the islands did not fight, and he had no idea how to deal with a woman who behaved as if she were the equal of any warrior. Instead of speaking, he merely grunted assent. I would not let that stop you, she said. I have been trained to fight. All of my calling are. I am sure, but it would be a most terrible breach of hospitality. We do not slay our guests. You are very certain you could slay me. Yes, I am a space marine. Another simple statement of fact. He was one of the mightiest warriors humanity could produce, enhanced in a hundred different ways taught to kill in every way, bloodied in combat against the vile forces of chaos. There was no way any mortal could stand in combat against him. She smiled at him, showing small, perfect teeth. It was a cold smile, with nothing friendly in it. She moved her hand. Ragnar sensed a gathering of energies, but was unsure of what was happening. Then he tried to move, and his limbs would not respond. A psyker, he realized. She was a psyker, one of those witches gifted with extraordinary mental powers, one of which was now quite obviously the ability to paralyze any target she wished. Ragnar suddenly felt very foolish and very angry. He exerted his strength, 
willing his limbs to respond. Her arrogant smile grew wider and colder as she watched him struggle. This just served to make him angrier still. Somewhere in the dim depths of his mind, the beast that had been a part of him since he became a space wolf began to snarl with frustrated rage. It did not like being caged, even if the cage was his own body. Perhaps this was a threat he had sensed when the strangers first appeared. Psychers were notoriously prone to possession by demons of chaos. Perhaps even one of them had wormed its way into the very heart of the Fang. Space Wolf, I could kill you now and there is nothing you could do about it. She said calmly. Ragnar could almost smell the woman gloating and he was livid. He could not sense any other alteration in her scent. She did not appear to be tainted by chaos. Perhaps, after all, she was simply doing all this to prove a point. Beads of sweat stood out on his brow as he forced his numb limbs to move. Time seemed to slow to a glacial pace as he urged his body to reject her hold on him. One of his fingers quivered slightly and a look of utter shock appeared on her face as if she had never seen anyone break her hold before. No matter how slightly, he smelled her sudden loss of confidence. A faint flicker in the power as that affected her control. Suddenly, somehow he could move. It was like being encased in molasses, but at least his limbs were his own once more. He seemed to be moving with incredible slowness, but at least he was moving. She let out a faint shriek. His hand was around her throat. Almost before he had thought of it, with his superhuman strength, all he had to do was close his fingers and her windpipe would be crushed. And now I could kill you, he hissed. And there is nothing you could do about it. He opened his hand and stepped back. But that would be neither honorable nor hospitable. They stood a moment, glaring at each other, both of them breathing hard. He realized that the use of her powers must have been as drained to her as hours of heavy exercise was to him. He himself was exhausted from resisting them as it had not been after 200 miles of forced march. You are very strong-willed, she said eventually, and he was not sure whether it was admiration, fear, or dislike he smelled. Perhaps some combination of them all. Apparently, he said. And there is something else within you. I sensed it as I wove the web. Is that what you call it? I saw something like a wolf. Large, dark, fierce. It was something woken when I joined the chapter, he said, not sure whether he should be discussing this with anyone from outside the Space Wolves. A wolf spirit? No, it's part of your own spirit, something that separates you from normal people. It was bound to me. I suppose that is one way of looking at it, albeit a primitive way. Now you are being insulting again. She smiled, and this time there was some warmth in the smile. Something large, dark and fierce. A snarling wolf within the soul of Ragnar. But had this been bound to him, or simply awakened further by his transformation? Perhaps the primitive Ragnar, the Thunderfist, who had challenged the sea demon, who had slain a dozen men in his burning home, had always had the wolf spirit. It had brought him this far, and had been his greatest weapon, but with the gene seed of Rus, his ferocity was elevated to a new height, something he had to keep in check with his rational human nature. Barely a blood claw initiate, Ragnar, Stybjorn, Lars, Nils and Sven had seen their first conflict, and after barely a few weeks of rest, a new trouble had arisen. The Inquisition, that unaccountable, secretive organization who leaves only disaster and ruin in their wake, arrived on Fenris. They had come for the Space Wolf's aid in reclaiming the three pieces of the Talisman of Lycos, an ancient Eldari amulet in order to save the dying imperial planet Arius, currently wracked by a disgusting plague. 
tasked to assist the pair of inquisitors Ivan Sternberg and Kara Isan. It was Ragnar who upon their arrival felt a sickly unnerving feeling. He could tell by the sense of his brothers that he was alone in this feeling as paranoia gripped him. He did not trust these strangers. It had only been a short time since Ragnar had the knowledge forced into his brain about the wider Imperium. A million different worlds with people who had cultures just as concrete as the one he grew up in on Fenris. It would be his mentor, the wolf priest Ranek, the one who had chosen him to be elevated, who shared Ragnar's distrust in these outsiders and assigned the young Bloodclaw the task of watching over them. It was during their stay at the Fang that the Inquisitor Kara Isan began to interrogate and prod the young Space Wolf. Clearly unimpressed with the savage she saw before her, the Space Wolves were known for being a hearty bunch, boisterous men who reveled in feasting, drinking and fighting. But just as Ragnar was surprised by the attitude of the outsider before him, she in turn was caught off by Ragnar's matching wit an understanding of the hidden war within words, and the surprising monstrous will he had hidden inside. Ragnar, Stybjorn, Lars, Nils and Sven prepared themselves. The mission to reforge the Talisman of Lycos was critical to the security of the Imperium, and for the first time, Ragnar would journey to the stars. Under the command of Sergeant Hakon, their mentor from their time at Rusvik, the young Bloodcores left their home behind. Ragnar, feeling that melancholy we all feel when we leave the place we grew up. But with his pack by his side, Ragnar, his mentor, and his budding friendship with Sven, Ragnar was not alone. Despite the presence of the Grim Skull Stibion, Ragnar's hatred had somewhat softened. He would not mourn his passing but he found himself not actively wishing for his death. The journey had begun, and Ragnar's first experience of warp travel was not a pleasant one. The way it churned and seemed to be rejected by every fiber of his being. Arriving on the planet Galt in search of a piece of the talisman, Ragnar and the pack descended onto the world infested by orcs. Coming face to face with the Xenos for the first time, it disgusted him. He had grown up with the large and dangerous monsters of Fenris, but something deep and visceral within rejected these disgusting creatures. The fighting throughout Galt was fierce, and their blades were thick with alien blood. Infiltrating their way into the orc-infested capital, they found what they were looking for. The talisman hung around an orc warboss's neck. The energies of the talisman had seeped into the foul Xenos' soul increasing the orc's power and aura to an unnatural level. The Space Wolf pack and the Inquisitors, under Hakon's leadership, prepared to take their prize, using the psychic gifts of Kara Isan to infiltrate themselves into the war boss's camp. Upon finally reaching their target, the wolves attacked, slaughtering the war boss's guards. But they were utterly outmatched by the talisman-infused war boss. Ragnar was barely holding his own, and was saved from certain death by the desperate intervention of Lars. But this came at a cost. The war boss snapped the young wolf's neck, laughing in delight. Ragnar's inner wolf spirit howled with rage, and with the help of Kara, the talisman was retrieved, with Hakon carrying the corpse of Lars as the group retreated for extraction. The time was ticking away as orcs began to swarm their position. Surrounded and moments away from extraction, Ragnar uttered the words that no proud Fenrisian would have dared say. He bartered for their lives, something almost completely unheard of to a space wolf. But the ploy worked. The confusion and contemplation from the orcs bought them just enough time to be extracted back into orbit. It was genius, and as the survivors cheered for their success, Ragnar stared down at his stomach, seeing the gaping wounds he had taken seconds before their rescue, and he collapsed to the ground.
he was at death's door for weeks. With the intervention of aid on the Inquisitor's ship and the psychic powers of Kara Isan, Ragnar was wrenched back to the land of the living. Though very unspace wolf, Ragnar's tactical delay had saved them all, but he felt no joy in the mission's success. Lars was dead. The melancholy of losing a brother who you had lived by, shared stories and food with is a feeling shared by many in our world who have been unfortunate enough to experience war. Lars had saved him, but Ragnar couldn't save him. He even missed his funeral rites. If only he had been stronger, if only he hadn't been so weak. Ragnar remembered the stories about the old fangs, the veterans who were the last surviving members of their original Blood Claw pack, and the thought filled him with dread. Recovering from his wounds, with the help of the Inquisitor Kara Isan, with whom Ragnar had become close to, he was at last reunited with the remainder of his pack. With a piece of the Eldari talisman collected from the vaults of the Fang, and the one recovered from the Orc Warboss on Gold, only one piece remained. Using the two pieces in hand as a beacon, Kara Isan utilized her psychic powers to locate the last piece, leading them to a location dreaded and desired throughout the galaxy. A space hulk. The mass of ancient and modern ship carcasses that drifted between the reality and that realm of madness, the warp. Often infested by horrifying xenos and abominations, it would be a long and perilous journey for any looking for the prizes held at their center. Again, the pack and the Inquisitors set off on their path, traveling miles through damp, stale steel corridors, possibility of danger being around every corner. The feelings of failure plagued Ragnar's thoughts. He had to control himself, lest the others sense his wariness through his scent. The expedition delved further and further, until they were suddenly ambushed by a horde of malnourished and gaunt gene stealers. The doubt Ragnar had been experiencing manifested. He was distracted, and only with the intervention of Sven did he survive. He admonished himself for this weakness. His brothers needed him, and he had to let go of this cloud, or those counting on him would suffer. Reaching the nest of the gene stealers, again the group was attacked. Ragnar, Sven, Hakon, Stybjorn, and Nils unleashed themselves upon the horde. Ragnar found himself renewed and butchered the monsters around him almost like swimming through a tide of broken flesh. Controlling the inner wolf spirit briefly, he took a moment to observe his surroundings, locating the talisman that the gene stealers were desperate to protect. He'd launched himself upon the commanding node, slicing the talisman from the bio flesh, breaking the horde's link with each other. They were victorious, covered in gore and xenos filth. Ragnar turned and mirrored Sven's large grin, the wolf spirits inside sated by the grand slaughter. Returning to the Inquisition's flagship, the expedition raced towards Arius. The world was in ruin. The plague that had emanated from the mysterious Black Pyramid of the world had claimed millions in its wake. Upon reaching the entrance, they were all witness to the horrifying pus and disease-ridden corpses of the unfortunate inhabitants. As Ragnar, the pack, and the Inquisitors entered the temple, an Eldari hologram warned them to go no further. They meddled with things that they best left undisturbed. This path that they were on would only lead to catastrophe. The words of Xenos were never to be trusted and the expedition did not heed the warning, despite Ragnar harboring doubts. Reaching the last door with the reforged talisman, they opened it and peered into the heart of the chamber. And just before Ragnar could come to terms with a sudden wave of dread and nausea, a booming voice echoed from within. An enormous, disgusting demon covered in rotting flesh and open sores that weeped foul rivulets of pus, the jovial, toxic voice of Botulaz. 
A great unclean one of Nurgle thanked them for freeing him from his prison. The horrified group were set upon. Walking corpses flung themselves upon them. The situation was hopeless, and in their retreat, Inquisitor Sternberg fell first, followed by their fellow Bloodcore Nils, drowning in an encased tower of corrupted green pus. Sergeant Hakon led Ragnar and the survivors back to the entrance. They had been deceived, outmatched, even showing the signs of infection themselves. Moments away from being swarmed by the raising corpses of the city around them, this did not feel like the warrior's death that every Fenrisian desired. They prepared for their end, but the sickly Kara Isan spoke of a plan that filled Ragnar with dread. Ragnar, Stybjorn, Hakon, Kara and Sven returned back to the chamber, barreling their way into the walking horde to confront the great unclean one. Ragnar fought with a fury not seen since the night his home was destroyed. The wolves bought time, time for Kara to unleash the power of the Eldari talisman. Ragnar had grown close to Kara, to a level he knew that was unfit for a space marine. But duty always came first, as he howled in rage, his knuckles white from gripping his chain axe. Kara unbound her soul from her body, sacrificing her life to seal the demon inside. Ragnar's first expedition from Fenris left scars, two of his friends dead. But as is the life of a space wolf, there will be more to come. You think you know glory, well, just because you have survived a single day of battle? To feel the thunder of munitions like the fury of the gods as the ground tears apart around you. To wet your blade with the blood of kings. To be the first man to land upon a planet crawling with alien terrors. That is to know true glory. Mark it well. You bloody daydreaming again? Sven asked. Or can't you answer a civil question? You'll find out when I ask one, Ragnar responded, his nostrils dilating, catching the faintest hint of an acrid, inhuman scent on the wind. He looked over to Sven to see his friend had caught it too. Sven's marginally less keen nose twitched. The long moustache he had been cultivating since the campaign on Zekitor moved like the whiskers of some great hunting beast. You smell that? He asked. Ragnar nodded. Ice fiend, I reckon. Not too close, not too far either. Perhaps you're not quite so bad at tracking as I thought, said Ragnar. We can't tore half the razor keen senses of the blessed of bloody Russ, said Sven. Maybe I should let you go and check this out on your own. After all, the cubs will give you all the credit for killing the beasts anyway. Even if I were to kill a whole bloody tribe single-handed while you stood back and applauded my fine bloody technique with a chainsword, they would praise you for it. Ragnar checked his weapons. Tracking down the Ice Fiends was the purpose of this expedition. They had been raiding along the coastal glaciers and slaughtering the Macedon herds. It was time they were taught a lesson. I think you are just jealous of my well-deserved reputation, he said. I would be jealous if it was well-deserved. Unfortunately, all you do is hog the credit for my own heroic deeds. Like I did on Micah, said Ragnar. When I pulled you out of that squig pit before they could gnaw you to death. You always have to bring that up, don't you? Said Sven in a tone of mock gloom. I would have fought my way out in a few heartbeats if you had not interrupted. Your plan was to choke the squig to death by thrusting yourself down its throat then, was it? I was lulling it into a false sense of security. Muttered Sven, his eyes checking the horizon. Ragnar could tell he too had spotted the massive white shapes up till now were near invisible among the snows. Sven made a few practice swings with his deactivated chainsaw just to loosen up. I don't remember that being covered in the Codex Tacticus. I'm a brilliant improviser. Apparently. Well, what about it? I don't cast up all the times I've pulled your fat out the bloody fire. What about the time on Venom? when I saved you from those heretics before they could chop you down with your own chainsword. 
You never bloody well hear me mention that, do you? Not more than once or twice a day. Sven was in full flow now, not to be stopped. Or how about on that Space Hulk near Corellia or Corellias or whatever it was bloody well called when I saved you from those Tyranids? Never mention that, do I? You just did. Or what about that time- Sven? Yes? Shut up. Don't tell me to bloody well shut up, Ragnar bloody so-called black mane. Just because you have a head swollen to the size of a small bloody planetoid doesn't mean I can't kick you. No. Can't you hear it? Hear what? That! There was a sound of cracking ice. Ragnar saw a crevasse start to open ten strides away. Glacier's breaking up! He hissed, beginning to run forward as the crack splitting the ice came nearer. I would never have noticed, said Sven sarcastically. Quite probably, said Ragnar, racing forward and leaping over the gap. Sven was a few strides behind him, but leapt fractionally too late. It was obvious that he was not going to make it across the widening gap, and was going to tumble down. Russ alone knew how far. Ragnar leaned out and grabbed his friend's outstretched hand, tugging him forward and sending him sprawling into the ice beside him. Siding with the ice fiends now, eh? Says Sven around a mouthful of snow. No, just saving your life yet again. So you say. I was doing fine before your sneak attack sent me sprawling. Going to wedge open the crevasse with your thick skull, were you? Best use for it, most likely. Sven bounded to his feet and cast a casual glance over his shoulder, checking on the distance separating them from the ice fiends. Several hundred strides lay between them still. It looked like the ice fiends were waiting to see whether the crevasse took them. Yours is the only head around here big enough to fill that hole, said Sven cheerily. The ground beneath their feet started to move again as the glacier shook. Maybe we should get off this frozen river of ice before it swallows us both up, said Ragnar. Well, looks like the only way out is through them, said Sven, gesturing to the approaching ice fiend. And your point is? Just giving you directions in case you get lost again, said Sven, turning and racing towards the approaching creatures. Ragnar followed him, the snow crunching under his ceramite boots and splashing off his greaves, his breath clouding the air like steam. The ice feeds bellowed challenges. The two blood claws answered with their whooping war cries. It was glorious to be one of the chosen of Russ. The brotherhood and adventure was everything Ragnar had dreamed it would be. His heightened senses made his blood pump with a fury unseen. His war spirit howled with glory as he slayed the enemies of the All Father. To feast and drink in the halls of the Fang with his brothers, singing the sagas and deeds of the fallen heroes. With their heightened abilities and senses, Ragnar could feel the presence of his brothers around him, the reassurance and safety it provided. It had been over a decade since his transformation of Ragnar Thunderfist the Primitive to Ragnar the Space Wolf, whose deeds and reputation had already earned him the moniker Black Mane. Ragnar and his pack had seen numerous war zones, and his experience of the Imperium and its many frontiers had expanded his horizon. It was a journey full of hardship and pain, but also a brotherhood. His friendship with Sven had deepened over the years. Their banter was legendary, ensuring that if Ragnar ever dared to feel full of himself, he was always one joke away from Sven pulling him back down to Earth. They were close. They feasted, drank and fought together constantly, though at times Ragnar felt some distance from his friend. Sven was a Fenrisian and Space Wolf through and through. Loud, boisterous, brave and content, he did not ponder much about life, but Ragnar found himself at times lost in thought, reliving the past in his head, thinking in ways that were characteristically un-Fenrisian, such as stalling for time with the Orc Warboss and offering a fake surrender. Ragnar began to wonder, if this is how those in leadership felt. The balance between a soldier and the son of Fenris. On the edge of promotion from Bloodclaw to the rank of Grey Hunter, distressing news arrived at the Fang. In the Great Hall, the entire chapter assembled. The legendary Great Wolf, 
Their chapter master Logan Grimnar spoke of dire news. There had been an uprising on the world of Garm, a sacred world of the chapter that had enshrined the legendary Spear of Rus, a relic forged by the Allfather that was held in the hand of the Primarch Lehman Rus himself. The spear had been taken. Their most holy site had been desecrated by the hands of filth. Ragnar, Sven, Sergeant Hakon, and Stybjorn raced to their stations, finding themselves placed within the great company of the legendary Lord Beric Thunderfist. The grizzled veteran of the Legion was spoken of in awe, having fought in countless battles and even dueling with the infamous Khan the Betrayer the consequences being a bionic arm that became his heraldry, his thunder fist. Known for his directness and to lead at the front, Beric was a man who chased glory and had plenty to spare for his brothers. Arriving within the system, the Space Wolves fleet came under immediate fire. In the somewhat enormous but yet claustrophobic conditions of interstellar warfare, Ragnar and the pack followed Beric into war. The thought of dying in the cold, vacuous space was unnerving to a proud Fenrisian. Beric's company launched themselves at the enemy, boarding a Chaos Cultist warship. The fight through the miles of steel corridor was a blitzkrieg of violence. They fought like an unstoppable force, Ragnar even showing distinction and ingenuity by causing a distraction that alleviated the pinned forces of the legendary Beric and his wolf guard. Though slightly admonished for his forwardness with the Wolf Lord by his mentor Sergeant Hakon, the invading wolves made their way deeper into the ship, laying their explosive charges at the heart, all covered in gore of the heretical enemies of the All Father. As the company retreated, many space wolves howled their death cries and met their glorious end. Making it back onto their own vessel, an intense silence washed over them. Ragnar and the company turned to their leader. With the exploding enemy ship visible from the windows, Beric cheered, lording at how they had built a suitable pyre for their fallen brothers. The roar from the walls was deafening. Ragnar unleashed all the anxiety he had accumulated over the battle, relishing in the joy of brotherhood. The pack hoisted up the centuries-old Sergeant Hakon on their shoulders, but Beric bellowed them to be silent. Again, quiet fell, but as Beric announced that Imperial reinforcements had arrived, the second roar was even louder, and with Beric's final words, he ordered to break out the ale and to lift a drink to their fallen brothers. The third roar was by far the loudest. This is what it meant to be part of the wolves, the camaraderie, the glory, and the bond of brothers. The quick thinking and ferocity of Ragnar had not gone unnoticed. Beric and his wolfguard even requested an audience with the young pup to give him gratitude and to seemingly size him up. The first stage of the war had been a glorious success, but the surface of Garm would be an altogether different beast. Ragnar was about to face his most grueling and painful journey yet, and Garm would change him forever. Ragnar looked into the medical sarcophagi, wondering why Hakon had sent for him. The old sergeant lay stiff and unmoving. Gurgling tubes, filled with greenish fluid, snaked from the walls of the ancient biomagical machine in the sergeant's flesh. His carapace had been peeled away, giving him a strange, vulnerable look. His skin was pallid, like that of a corpse. A metal mask covered one half of his head, hiding the great hole in his skull. The scars on the remaining side of his face stood out even more strongly. Only his eyes looked alive. They burned with fury. The wolf priest nodded to Ragnar, telling him it was alright to speak and then retired to his duties. A few moments later, Ragnar could hear him mustering medical incantations over some of the other patients. How are you? Ragnar asked. Hakon's lips quirked into a tight smile but the fury never left his eyes. I have been better, 
he said. You will be so again. Hakon gave a near imperceptible shake of the head. I do not think so, Ragnar. I have heard the healers speaking. There is too much damage to my body for me to heal. Parts of my brain were blown away. My spine is damaged. I will never fight again. Or walk, for that matter. There was no self-pity in Hakon's manner. Only truth. Ragnar did not know what to say. Confronted by the magnitude of the sergeant's loss, he suddenly felt very young and inexperienced. I heard you were field promoted, said Hakon. That is why I asked to see you. I would have come anyway. No matter. I think you will do well, Ragnar, if you live and learn to control that fury of yours. It's a great thing in a warrior to be a berserker. It is not such a good thing in a leader. A leader needs to be able to see clearly at all times. It's one thing to throw your own life away in combat, even if it's not a very clever thing. It's another thing to throw away the life of your pack. I do not think uh, I am ready for this. No one ever does, no matter what age they are. Do not think that way. I can see you have it in you to be a great leader one day, Ragnar. You are a thinker, perhaps too much of one, and the chapter has need of men who can think as well as fight. Ragnar did not know what to say, so he kept quiet. I would have recommended you for Grey Hunter soon. You and your packmates Sven and Strebjorn are about ready for it. It seems Beric Thunderfist has already seen that. What do you mean? The sergeant's voice was soft and rasping, and Ragnar realized there was a certain underlying sadness in it. Hakon was speaking like a man who knows he is going to die soon, he realized. I had some doubts, but I do not think Lord Beric has any. I think you are just about ready for Grey Hunter, but I am not totally sure. Because of your fury, it can be a terrible weakness in a man. Beric seems to think differently, but then he always lacked a certain prudent caution. Ragnar opened his mouth to say something, feeling that he should defend the Wolf Lord, but Hakon interrupted. Don't misunderstand me. The Wolf Lord is hungry for greatness, but he has other virtues that make up for it. He is a great leader, whatever flaws he may have, and you can learn from him if you watch him. You'll learn from his flaws too, if you are as smart as I think you are. Why are you telling me this? Because I am an old man, Ragnar, and I do not have much more time in the flesh. I can see something in you, Ragnar. Rannik could as well. I'm not sure that it is something good, but good or no, I believe you will have a great impact on the chapter if you survive. I am trying to make sure that you do more good than harm. I always do my best. Aye, and that might be your undoing, Ragnar. For you are headstrong and have very distinctive views of what the best is. It's a failing that most wolves have until we get some grey hair and a little sense. Ragnar wondered whether the healing potions were making Hakon's mind wander. They sometimes did that even to men with constitutions as strong as the space marines. Under the strain of injury, even their body's ability to metabolize poison and drugs somewhat behaved strangely. Is that all you have to say? Ragnar asked. No. Despite what I just said, I wanted to tell you that I was proud of you. You were the best batch of aspirants I ever trained at Rusvik. Maybe the best I ever saw. See that you live up to that. Pride filled Ragnar at the old man's words. Hakon had always been a rough-tongued man and never spared a word of praise for anybody. Apparently, he had hidden his true feelings. At this moment, two iron priests entered. Something about their attitude told Ragnar they had come to take Hakon away. They gestured for him to leave. Hakon saw this and nodded. That's all. Go, now, and may Rus watch over you. Ragnar nodded and made the sign of the wolf. He could see Hakon flinch as he tried to do the same, but his body would not respond. Ragnar halted for a moment and then turned to go. As he left the medical bunker, he knew for certain that he would never see the old man again, and that left him greatly saddened. 
falling like the thunder of the Allfather. Ragnar, Stybjorn, Sergeant Hakon and Sven drop podded down to the surface of Garm. Taking some slight damage, the group fell off course, landing in the midst of a Chaos Cultist position. The inner wolf howled for slaughter, and Ragnar cut down the corrupted shrine desecrators. They had racked a bloody tally, but more kept coming, and they're beginning to be overwhelmed, stabbed, beaten, shot, and moments away from death once again. It was a brother who saved him. Sergeant Hakon roared in their combat, saving his life, but in the process he was mortally wounded, leaving Lord Beric to promote Ragnar to temporary command of his pack. At the edge of death, Hakon gave his last minutes of life to speak his final words to him, Ragnar. You are a thinker, perhaps too much of one. Being an overthinker, Ragnar often felt disconnected from moments when he felt he should lose himself in. Sometimes we know that feeling of being an observer rather than a participator. You have to learn to control your anger. His inner wolf spirit, it had saved his life many times, that reserve of fury. But even in our own lives we know, anger blinds and poisons reason. Be careful of the youthful righteousness you feel, for it has not been tempted by the wisdom of experience. We are never as smart or as wise as we think we are. Surety should come from experience, not blind self-belief. But why say any of this at all? It was because like Rannik, like his brothers, Hakon believed in Ragnar. Even Lord Beric could see the potential. It was a passing of a torch. The will of those who had passed it to Hakon long ago, and Ragnar accepted it as his mentor passed from this world. Returning to his pack, Ragnar and the others prepared themselves for the upcoming battle. Rescuing some loyalist survivors outside of the hive cities of Garm, the wolves discovered the source of the uprising to be a corrupted member of the Imperial Ecclesiarchy, the accursed Sergius, who had sealed himself deep within his own bastion his temple to chaos, directing the information directly to the legendary great wolf, Logan Grimnar, and his wolf lords. The wolves set off to cleanse the world and reclaim the Spear of Rus, trudging through miles of murky and cold underground tunnels. As the Imperial forces engaged the heretical army above, Ragnar and Lord Beric's company found their way through. Reaching the temple gates, the wolves charged, howling their cries at the Allfather and Russ. Bloodclaws, Grey Hunters, the Long Fangs, and Wolfguard crashed upon the hordes of disgustingly mutated cultists. Ragnar with Sven, Stybjorn, and his pack behind him leaped into combat, cleaving their enemy apart, smoke and fire all around them. Like men possessed, the wolves tore their way into the temple, and Ragnar finally caught sight of him. Sergius, wielding the Spear of Rus, surrounded by dark, twisting energies, and a circle of dark priests chanting in the black tongue of chaos. The sight horrified and angered Ragnar to his core, but before he could interrupt the ritual, a familiar form seemed to sprout from the inside out of one of the cultists before him. That sickly, ancient, ornate armor he had seen before. Maddox, the Thousand Sun Sorcerer, was alive. Taunting the young wolf, the Chaos Sorcerer unsheathed his poisonous Chaos Blade and dueled with Ragnar once again. Ragnar was outmatched, barely holding on. Even with the help of Sven, it was not enough. Maddox rammed his sword through Sven's chest, dropping the bleeding wolf to the ground. Ragnar again had seen a brother put his life before his, and the wolf spirit within him was unleashed. All around him, Thousand Sun Marines exploded out of the foolish cultist victims. Sergius was channeling a chaotic ritual through the spear. Maddox, continued to taunt Ragnar during their duel. The wolves would die here. Garm will become a new Prospero, and the demon Primarch Magnus will enter the material universe once again. Their weapons clashed, 
at blinding speed. The duel was brutal and was only broken apart by the swarming mass of thousand suns and space wolf bodies clashing up on them. With a brief respite, Ragnar and Lord Beric reunited and fought back to back. They had to make a break for Sergius and the spear and stop the ritual from summoning more of the thousand suns and close the gaping warp portal emerging in front of them. Buying time with his wolf guard, Beric allowed Ragnar to charge at the corrupted ecclesiarchal priests. Ragnar, covered in wounds and on his last reserves of rage drawn from witnessing his friend Sven being mortally wounded, he tore the heretic apart. But in the wake of his victory, a looming figure appeared. A large, one-eyed face projected itself from the warp portal, a shimmering dark silhouette with one baleful eye, Magnus. As if on instinct, the battered, wounded Ragnar reached down and seized the spear of Rus. With the last of his strength, he threw it directly into the projected eye of the demon, closing the portal and leaving the hateful screams of a god echoing across the battlefield. Ragnar awoke inside the cold, deep cell below the fang on Fenris. The wolves had won. The thousand suns had been banished, and the one-eyed demon Magnus had been defeated. But the spear of Rus had been lost, casted into the warp portal by Ragnar, sealing it inside. Ragnar had saved them, but at the cost of the chapter's most priceless relic, the peace that was said to be claimed by Russ when he would walk again amongst men. But now that prophecy was in jeopardy. The mix of emotions Ragnar was going through was exhausting. Surety in his actions, shame at having lost the spear, nervousness at his fate within the chapter, fear at the accusations of chaotic corruption, comfort from the counsel of Sven and his old mentor Ranek. Brought before the great wolf Logan Grimnar and the wolf lords, they decided the fate of this young pup. Ragnar was divisive, half supported his actions, whereas the others decried them. Many voices insisted that the foolish brother be punished for his sacrilege. Some even called for his death. Ragnar was a problem, a split amongst the chapter that they could not afford to have. He felt awful. To be at the centre of all this attention is a position no one would envy. The great wolf Grimnar debated with his council and presented the young Ragnar with his fate. Ragnar would be sent to Terra, the heart and capital of the Imperium. He was now Ragnar Blackmane, the Wolfblade. He would join the detachment sent to guard the ancient allies of the wolves, the navigator house Belisarius. Ragnar knew what this task meant. Exile. Gathering his personal belongings, he bade farewell to his friend Sven. A lump caught in his throat as he realised that they may never see each other again. And he loved his brother, even if he couldn't get the words out. As he strolled to the ship, his mentor Ranek told him not to lose hope, that this was not the punishment he believed it to be. Holy Terror was just as dangerous as any battlefield. The birthplace of the Imperium held the highest level of wealth and political maneuvering within the galaxy. It would be unlike any war zone Ragnar had ever seen, and every action, reaction, and expression would be judged and measured. Again, Ragnar caught a lump in his throat. Ranek had supported, counseled, and believed in Ragnar for years. And the thought of never seeing him again was heartbreaking. Alone, Ragnar ascended the ship. A wolf without a pack. A man without his friends. And the looming feelings of shame and failure. Aboard the ship, Ragnar met his charge. The navigator, Ga the navigator Gabriella Belisarius. Her sharp, angular features unnerving him. But not as much as the hidden truth concealed on her forehead. 
the navigator's third eye. For humanity to sail that sea of madness, the warp required those born with the eye that could withstand looking into the warp's tides. The very existence of the Imperium was hinged upon its logistics, and for those who controlled it, wielded enormous political power, almost untouchable even to the unaccountable Inquisition. The dynasty houses of the navigators were obscenely wealthy, and wherever wealth lies, corruption, politics, and murder follow. For over 10,000 years, the walls of Fenris and House Belisarius have been allies. One navigating the vast navies of the walls, and the other offered protection and a personal guard of wolf blades. They were to pledge themselves to the ruling Celestark of House Belisarius, just as if they were the great walls themselves. Ragnar was about to enter a pit of vipers. The news had come during Ragnar's trial. The previous Celis Stark and a veteran Wolfblade had been murdered. Not even a day into their journey to terror, Ragnar and Gabriella were attacked, an assassination attempt from within their own ship. The level of dedication shocked Ragnar. Life on Fenris had always been direct, but now his enemies could be anywhere and anyone. It was weeks of constant vigil with Ragnar staying close by Gabriella's side. The woman was witty, and clearly was dangerous herself, but there was no space for lapses, even if something about the navigator made him unnerved. Finally the two reached their destination, Holy Terror. The capital of the Imperium, the birthplace of humanity, the resting place of the crippled Allfather on his golden throne. You can imagine the mix of excitement and fervour flowing from Ragnar's veins as he looked upon the planet-side city, its very silhouette screaming of power and obedience. The mass of ships and people swarming the space around Holy Terror was unlike anything Ragnar had ever seen. Making landfall within House Belisarius's quarters, the smell of pollution and incense almost overwhelmed the razor-sharp senses of Ragnar. A thick haze had draped itself over everything, blending with the billions of lights, blurring the lines between night and day. It was not what Ragnar had expected, and the claustrophobic feel must have been shocking. Greeted by an honor guard, Lady Gabriella and Ragnar finally set foot on terror, and immediately Ragnar caught a familiar scent, turning to see his Wolfblade brother approach. Torin the Wayfarer, a wolf whose appearance matched the refined and trimmed decorum of the Terran guards, a man who seemed to be more at home in this pit of vipers. Mighty Hagar the Mountain, an enormous Astarte whose unexpected mutation of his gene seed meant he grew larger than any of his brothers. What he lacked for in intellect, he made up for it in appetite and brute strength. Valkoth, an elderly scholar whose very preoccupation was hated and ridiculed amongst those born of Fenris, seen as weak and heretical. And then, Ragnar. The cunning, fury-driven youth who had lost the Spear of Rus. They were all, in a way, outcasts. The ones who didn't quite fit in with their chapter. It was comforting to have brothers so far from home, but immediately Ragnar was gripped by a sense of hollowness. Settling into his cramped quarters, that looked like someone who had tried to recreate the conditions of the Fang through a description. He settled into his new home, his new battleground. Even on his first day, danger found him, as Ragnar, Torin, and Hagar were ambushed whilst drinking within a local tavern. The ferocity of the walls was clearly surprising to those foolish enough to attack an Astarte. Ragnar even surprised his new brothers. Thinking on the words Rannik left with him, Ragnar began to think in a new way, to see the bigger picture. That cunning he had shown with the long-dead Inquisitor Kara Isan had evolved. The hidden meaning within words, the subtlety of body language and sense. Even the veteran Wolfblade Torin was surprised, 
at how quickly Ragnar had caught on. Immediately, Ragnar was plunged into a situation that would change the entire political structure of the Imperium. The murder of the previous Celestark, Lady Gabriella's father, would be the most dangerous path he had ever walked. Covert missions, investigations, and dissecting schemes became the young wolf's constant day-to-day -day life. The investigation into the previous Celestark's death had put Ragnar, Torin and Hagar in the presence of extremely dangerous grouped, armed militias, zealous militant purists that resided deep in the slums of terror, decrying the existence of their mutant navigator overlords, and even the presence of the other navigator houses. Accompanying Lady Gabriella and Torin into the luxurious quarters of House Veraci, Ragnar saw perhaps the most dangerous man in the Imperium. Cesare Ferracci. His palace was a fortress of security, hidden and overt. The navigator's ambition and cunning dripped from him, even designing the place of their meeting to throw off the keen senses of the wolves. Not that the navigator's alien scent could be read. To be before someone truly untouchable is a nerve-wracking experience, even if Ragnar couldn't feel fear. His every move was watched. To his Wolfblade brothers, Ragnar had picked up quickly on how to play the game. He knew to let them see him as a barbarian. His skill was noted. Only ones who played politics at the highest level could see, and the cunning of this emerging Wolfblade frightened House Ferraci. Continuing their investigation, Ragnar, Torin and Hagar travelled deep into the layers of civilization that were the stacked cities upon cities on terror. But danger found them, and they were ambushed by a horde of militant purists. Ragnar and his fellow Wolfblades tore them apart. Perhaps life on terror wouldn't be so different from Fenris. Almost overwhelmed, the Wolfblades retreated, delving further into the lightless depths of terror's underworld. Wounded, and with his friend Hagar on the edge of death, Ragnar lamented his position, reflecting on his shameful legacy. A Fenrisian whose legacy would be losing the spear and this exile. But Hagar told him he was wrong. Ragnar was special. He had touched the spear of Rus. Its power had aided him with Magnus. He had been sent here because the great wolf trusted him. Even Torin and Hagar could see his potential. Words Ragnar did not believe, but needed to hear. Surviving within the rotten depths of terror, Ragnar and his fellow Wolfblaze survived and made it back towards natural light. The thought burning in their mind that someone had betrayed them. Reunited with Lady Gabriella in the Belisarius' palace, the two shared what they had learned and spoke about life on terror bonding over missing the simplicities and directness they had known on Fenris. But this was the quiet before the storm. The lights inside the facility died, and darkness fell upon them. The wolf spirit inside Ragnar began to rile itself up. It could sense the uneasiness. They were under attack. Keeping Lady Gabriella by his side, and his brothers with the ruling Celestark, Ragnar evacuated down into the innermost sanctums of House Belisarius' vaults, but the sights inside horrified him. Monsters, twisted abominations lie within. If you gaze long enough into the abyss, the abyss will gaze back. The cost of peering into the warp with their third eye twisted the navigators into creatures of nightmare. The visuals, the alien scent, it horrified Ragnar. His friend Lady Gabriella could sense it. But what right did he have to judge? Did his chapter not also hide monsters? Their wolfen? The palace was under siege. A force of militant purists, clearly with a benefactor, had been set loose and were wrecking havoc. But it was all too messy. For Ragnar, it had to be a diversion. And his instincts were proven true. As fighting within a last stand, cleaving the zealots apart, he saw it. 
a figure that moved with a speed and grace that was beyond human, beyond even an Astarte, an imperial assassin. Digging into the deepest parts of his soul, Ragnar fought with everything he had, barely holding on as his wounds mounted. The assassin had leaped through their lines. His friend Hagar had been poisoned. The house guard were swarmed by militants, and the cellar Stark and Gabriella were moments away from death. With his chain blade broken, his body beginning to fail, Ragnar made one last gambit. Using his bare hands, he grabbed the squirming embodiment of death. The wolf spirit took over, and Ragnar used his bare fangs, gorging on the victim until nothing moved. Over a decade passed for Ragnar, recovering from his wounds with his friends, Torin, the mighty Hagar, and Lady Gabriella by his side. He was rewarded for his astounding efforts and victory over the assassination plot, orchestrated by Cesare Ferracci. A gleaming, sharp relic weapon was gifted to Ragnar, Frostfang a deadly chain blade whose value and craftsmanship were irreplaceable, but most importantly was Ragnar's inner victory. His loneliness had gone, his sense of being exiled had vanished under the Brotherhood of the Wolf Blades, and in performing his duty on a level that rippled throughout the Imperium, the time within the Brotherhood on Terror began to pass for the young wolf. A duty rife with the dedication and mindset that ruthless politics demanded. Ragnar and his fellow Wolfblades even found themselves embroiled in a Dark Angel's plot to capture and kill one of the elusive Fallen. Though the Dark Angels were the Wolves' greatest rivals, Ragnar had kept his word and promised to hold their secrets. It was a conflict that pointed to a name that haunted Ragnar, Maddox. It seems the Chaos Sorcerer was too stubborn to die. With the discovery of his dark rival's involvement, the Wolfblades were summoned back to Fenris, Ragnar returning for the first time in decades. The time for Ragnar to enjoy the sensation of home would be short, as immediately the horrifying news came to him. Lord Berek was on the edge of death, and their enemy had the Spear of Rus. In the Great Hall in the Fang, all of them sensed it immediately, smelling Ragnar's apocalyptic fury, with the Great Wolf commanding him to control himself. Ragnar was angry, angry at the sacrilege, but also at himself. His actions really did have the consequences that he feared. Ragnar swore an oath before all that he would return the spear or die trying. It was his mistake to fix, it was his shame to erase, it was his honour to reclaim. Joining the room priest Sigurd and his blood claws, Ragnar, Torin and Hagar cut an isolated figure amongst their brothers, stared at like they had been on terror, outsiders. But the cutting remarks from the young room priest Sigurd surprised Ragnar as did his unseemingly unmeasured, aggressive responses. Something was happening to him. His rage seemed uncontrollable. With Torin, Hagar, Sigurd and Lady Gabriella by his side, the strike force made their way to the world of Charis, a frozen hellscape that seems to give them all an unsettling feeling, making planet fall and engaging all kinds of abominations and cultists Ragnar found their accursed enemy once more, the Thousand Sons. The group were wounded, fighting with everything they had, as a group of Chaos Raptors descended upon them, but their sickly roars were matched by a distant howl. Men in Baroque grey armour, with manes of fur dripped over them, unleashed themselves from the shadows, slaughtering the corrupted filth. Piercing yellow eyes stared at Ragnar. He knew them well. He had seen that look on Kiel during his initiation into the chapter. A wolfen, 
the 13th Great Company, space wars lost during the time of the Horus Heresy, men who had walked beside Russ and the Allfather, wolves who had succumbed to the curse but had fought in the realm between realms for millennia. Ragnar couldn't believe it. Accompanying the legends to their camp, the wolves of the 40th millennium crumbled to their knees. That bestial instinct that Ragnar had fought down long ago re-emerged. His heart began to race. His fury was overwhelming. His desire to kill roared through his mind. His brothers around him, Torin, Hagar and Sigurd, were fighting this inner demon too. But for the other accompanying blood claws, sharp fangs, razor claws and fur sprouted. All were horrified at what was happening. The accursed Maddox was using the spear of Russ as a conduit for a ritual, awakening the wolfen curse within them. Ragnar's eyes changed. The piercing yellow shone out to his friends, each of them reflecting it back. Only four had kept their sanity and form, but it was a losing battle. Reunited with their brothers, 10,000 years from the past, Ragnar spoke to the 13th Lost Company. They spoke of Lehman Russ, the man. They spoke of his rough manner and imperate heart, of his wild oaths and petty rivalries, of his melancholic nature and his merciless rage. And in turn, Ragnar spoke of the Imperium and the Legion, but what captured the 13th Company's hearts was Fenris. He spoke of the Azaheim Peaks, the Great Seas, the Fang, seeing in their faces hope and melancholy. He spoke of home, connecting with his brothers kept the rising beast down, and as long as Ragnar lived, he would never forget this moment even when the prideful Hagar shared his treasured ale with them. Letting themselves be a distraction for their ancient enemies, the 13th Company bid their brothers farewell. Ragnar, Torin, Hagar, Lady Gabriella, Sigurd and the barely sane wolf and blood claws set out for Maddox. Ragnar would end this. He would avenge Lord Berek. He would overcome the wolf and curse rising within. He would abolish the shame he had carried for decades, and he would kill Maddox. You look awful, he said breathlessly. Ragnar tried to grin. So I am told, he said. He rested his hand on Hagar's breastplate, amazed that the burly wolf hadn't already sunk into the red dream. Save your strength. He said, looking down to where Sigurd knelt with Torrin besides Gabriella's prone form. I'll get the wolf priest. Are you, are you saying that the mighty Hager is lacking in strength? The wolf blade smiled weakly. I should thrash you for that. The young space wolf felt a terrible ache in his chest that had nothing to do with his wounds. Get up and try then. Torrin will take bets, I'm sure. Hagar's grin faded. Some other time, perhaps, he said softly. Is Gabriella safe? Ragnar glanced down at the navigator and tried to sound dismissive. Torin's with her, he said. She's resting, I think. That's good, the wolf blade said, his voice growing faint. Tell her I'm sorry. I didn't want to leave her. She knows, Higa, Ragnar said, his heart heavy with grief. She knows. The wolf blade's eyes grew unfocused. He blinked once more and smiled. Don't take too long getting to the hooves of Russ, he said, almost too faintly to hear. Or I'll have drunk all the good ale before you get there. He tried to laugh, but the breath escaped in a gentle sigh, and the mighty warrior grew still. Ragnar reached down and clasped his friend's broad hand in farewell. As he did, he saw the black gleam of Hagar's alehorn lying on the steps beside him. Maddox's hellblade had severed its carrying strap, but the vessel itself looked unharmed. The young space wolf picked it up and tied it to his belt, 
as he stood and made his way down the steps. A tremor shook the Chaos Temple, shifting the stones beneath the young Space Wolf's feet. He slipped on something slick and realized numbly that there was blood on his boots. Before the terrible ache in his heart, he could feel nothing from his waist to his neck. Using the spear as a walking stick, he made his way to Gabriella's side. Sigurd was bent over the injured navigator, pressing a bandage to the wound in her abdomen. Torrin looked up as the young space wolf approached. His eyes were dark again, and his expression was bleak as he clutched the navigator's hand in his own. As terrible as Hagar's death had been, the sight of the wounded navigator was more terrible still. He touched Sigurd on the arm. How is she? The young wolf priest shook his head. My engines and salves are made for space wolves, not people, he said. He caught sight of the wound in Ragnar's chest, and his eyes widened. Your wound is bleeding, he said, his voice taunt with concern. Sit down and let me see to it. It's nothing, the young space wolf replied. Save your energy for Lady Gabriella. Sigurd started to protest, but saw the look in Ragnar's eyes and thought better of it. He nodded his head in the direction of the steps. What of Hagar? Ragnar shook his head, tears stung at the corner of his eyes, and he couldn't bring himself to speak. Sigurd nodded gravely and rose to his feet. He had one last duty to perform for the burly wolf blade. Though he had fallen in battle, his gene seed would need to be returned to the Fang for implementation in a new initiate. Drawing a short, curved dagger from his belt, the priest made his way to the fallen warrior. Torrin looked up at Ragnar. What now? He asked. It sounds like the whole world is coming apart. It is. The young space wolf said bleakly, gazing down at Gabriella's form. Her eyes were closed, as though she were sleeping. The bandage over her chest was already staining red. Gently, he reached down and touched her cheek. Forgive me, my lady, was all he could manage to say. Bovi must know a way off the planet, Torrin said. They got here somehow, after all. No doubt, Ragnar agreed. Berek surveyed the ruined chamber one last time. Let's go, he told his men. There's nothing left to see here. But as the wolf lord turned away, Sven's eyes widened and he pointed back at the dais. You may want to take another look, my lord. The Wolf Lord glanced back. A white haze was taking shape where the governor's throne had once stood. It thickened, like mist, and he could see vague figures moving within. There was a clatter of bolters and a hum of power converters. As the long fangs rushed forward, weapons at the ready, Beric held out his hand. Hold your fire, he said. His nose caught a faint, familiar scent. The figures grew more distinct as though they were approaching from a great distance. Ragnar! Sven shouted. The young space wolf appeared first. The spear of Russ held upright in his hand. Torrin the wayfarer followed, with the limp body of a navigator in his arms. Bringing up the rear was a young space wolf priest, with eyes far older than his meager years. A vague, towering figure stood beyond the limping, battered wolves. Beric studied the silhouette, and despite the gulf that lay between them, he knew he was looking at one of his kin. The warrior raised a mighty axe in salute, and then vanished in the haze. In moments, the strange fog was gone. Ragnar approached the astonished wolf lord, his face pale as alabaster. Blood dripped onto the stones with every step he took. He sank slowly to his knees before Beric, and with both hands he offered up Russ's spear. We have won back our honor, my lord, the young space wolf said. The spear of Russ is ours once more. My sight is a gift I cherish. It allows me to read the wisdom of the wise, but should I lose my sight, I will still be able to hear compositions of great masters and the voice of the wise. If I should lose my hearing, I will still be able to tune into universal intelligence 
to understand the source of the wisdom of the wise. When the day comes that I lose my heart, that will be my greatest gift of all, for then I will be back home in the arms of the spirit I have embraced all my life. The spear of Rus had been returned. Ragnar had redeemed himself, though the cost of his journey had been high. In the gambit to reclaim the spear and stop the vile sorcery of Maddox, Ragnar again had almost died. His friend Lady Gabriella had sustained injuries that would be with her forever, and his friend, the boisterous and proud mighty Hagar, had been slain by Maddox another brother who had sacrificed himself to buy time, allowing Ragnar to ram the spear into his most hated rival, Maddox. Ragnar returns to his chapter, bidding farewell to Torin and Gabriella, placing the spear of Rus back at the temple on Garm. He placed Hagar's drinking horn upon the shrine, gazing at the surrounding Muriel, depicting Sergeant Hakon as a mere grey hunter to tune into universal intelligence, to understand the source of the wisdom of the wise. Wisdom is earned through the collection of experience, whether we try or not. A universal truth. With Ragnar reinstated and Lord Beric recovered from his wounds, the young wolf joined his company once more, ascending the ranks at frightening speed. Shortly after he single-handedly slew the orc warlord Borzak Khan in close combat, Ragnar ascended to the rank of veteran wolf guard, but his meteoric rise was not faultless. In a joint campaign with the Dark Angels, Ragnar made a mistake. In the sacred tradition that harkened back to the Great Crusade, the wolves and the angels would field champions wherever they met. Recreating the jewel of Lehman Russ and Lionel Johnson, Ragnar and the Dark Angel's champion began to duel. It was the first blood, but the young wolf lost control. The cut across his cheek riled his inner wolf spirit, and he retaliated, cleaving Frostfang at his fellow Astarte, cutting the champion's head off. Immediately he knew he had erred. The two chapters drew their blades on the edge of open war, but one figure stepped forward, Soriel, Soriel of the Dark Angels. Knowing that it meant his death, he challenged Ragnar to Dulium de Law, to the death. It was a matter of honor and redemption. Soriel knew that open warfare would cost them both, and that by challenging Ragnar, he could sacrifice himself to end the matter once and for all, to settle the dishonor. Back aboard their flagship, the wolves were divided, the young Bloodclaws and Grey Hunters cheering at the victory of their lord, but the older, wiser wolves chastising him. Where was the honorable Ragnar, who had fought on dozens of worlds, putting his life in danger for others? Where was the measured Ragnar, whose cunning had helped him excel as a wolf blade? The space wolf Nalfia razor tongue was particularly vicious, dressing down this upstart youth who had clearly been promoted beyond his talent. Though the young wolf accepted the duel, the wolves were attacked, Ragnar voxing over their situation and his apologies to Soriel, promising he would honor his word one day. The dishonor clung to Ragnar. He couldn't believe he made such a careless mistake. So many like Ranek, Hakon, Beric, and Hagar had believed in him. Because he used his head, he was a thinker, and in his rage he had acted like an uncontrolled initiate, still wrestling with the wolf spirit. Reuniting with Lord Beric, Ragnar joined his lord's council after being scolded. A situation had arisen. The wreckage of an Astarte ship had been found by the wolves. Discovering the heraldry of the chapter, the wolves snarled in disgust. The Flesh Terrors. A long history of hostility and hatred existed between the two. They were bloodthirsty, dishonorable murderers, Astartes who attacked the innocent, 
unredeemable. The two servants of the Emperor hated each other, both responsible for slights and betrayals of each other, both dishonoring each other's dead. The Council debated what to do with the floating wreckage. Some, like Nalfir Razortongue, decried that they should take it, add it to the arsenal of the walls. Some wanted to abandon it, but Ragnar, with Nafir razor tongue glaring daggers at him, suggested they return it. The thought, let alone the vocalization of it, was unthinkable. It was suicide. And what reason did they have to aid such vile warriors? But Ragnar did not back down. He defined the confines of his Fenrisian culture. There was a bigger picture to think about. These blood feuds were nothing in the face of the mounting enemies of the Imperium. They had to be better and put the past behind them, prepare for the wars to come. Something he knew in his heart, he fell far from achieving. But experience grants us all wisdom. Lord Beric agreed. The walls would return the Flesh Terror ship, and it would be Ragnar and Nalfir Razortongue who would do it. The two hated each other, but now their fate would be tied together. Cretacea, a world teeming with violent, cold-blooded reptiles, poisonous flora and fauna, lifeless deserts and treacherous swamps, home to the most brutal, bloodthirsty chapter in the Imperium, the Flesh Terrors. Ragnar and Nalfir awoke in chains. They had been interrogated for weeks. No space wolf would come here, not least to return a flesh terror's vessel, or speak of healing the old wounds and feuds. The Dark Angels were in many ways the opposite of the wolves, boisterous where measured, inflexible where free-spirited. But the flesh terrors were like a mirror, both concealing a darkness within the blood. Ragnar always having to keep in check the Wolfen curse and his flesh terror counterpart, Vorain, keeping in check the black rage of Sanguinius. Many had called the wolves of Fenris brutes, just as the flesh terrors had been called savages. Ragnar, since his shameful duel, had begun to evaluate, to use his experience. He had to think more like a leader just how Sergeant Hakon had told him long ago, to recognize the faults in himself, his anger, and to recognize the faults in those he looked up to too. Lord Beric, a great man, brave and a true Fenrisian, but one who represented the old ways of thinking, always seeking a glorious death. Perhaps there was a new way, there had to be, the future could not be this endless cycle. Met with contempt and hatred, Ragnar and Nelfir were given their sentence. Exile. They were cast out to the wilds. This poisonous world would claim them eventually. It would be with Sergeant Vorain that Ragnar's words struck true. Mulling over the Space Wolf's words for weeks, he found the common ground, decrying to his brothers Tradition is nothing but the wisdom of the past, a valuable guide, but it is not law. We shouldn't live by its every twist and turn. The past is rife with error and ignominy. It takes strength to put your hatred aside, to forgive people who have caused you so much pain. Do you have that strength? Sergeant Varane defied his brothers and set out to rescue his fellow Astartes. For weeks, Ragnar and Nalfir Raistung survived the horrifying conditions of Cretacea. All manners of nightmare creatures attempted to rip them apart and swallow them whole. But coming from an equally deadly world, the two had survived longer than any thought possible. After weeks of tracking, Sergeant Vorain found them. Their armor was rent, their skin was pale. Nalfir supported an enormous bite mark on his leg. A wound so poisonous that even an Astartes enhanced biology couldn't keep up. They had been found, but it became clear to them that Nalfir's wound was fatal. The hallucinating and sickly Nalfir confessed to Ragnar, 
that his vitriol was not of his own desire. Lord Beric had tasked him to do it. The revelation shocked Ragnar. Why? It was because Ragnar needed to be pushed, baited over his pride and ambitions, and most importantly, his anger. Ragnar carried the weight of the will of those who had died for him. Brothers and friends had given their lives to protect him because Ragnar had the potential to surpass them all. Beric did this because he believed in him. He could be their greatest champion if he was nurtured, tested, distilled. Instantly, Ragnar's perception of the brother who he had hated changed. Ragnar let his dying brother go as a massive draconic beast approached their position. Varane chased after the wounded wolf, but Ragnar stopped him, not one to deny a Fenrisian the chance at a good death. Ragnar returned to Fenris, now fears coffin in tow, a life led worthy of the sagas and a new cemented mindset. Stepping out from Ragnar's shadow, Sergeant Varane breathed the cold air of Fenris, walking into the den of wolves, ready for peace. The feud was over. Decades passed for the young wolf. The combination of the ferocious combatant, mixed with the knowledge of politics and the wisdom gained from overcoming his mistakes, Ragnar was perhaps the brightest star rising through the walls of Fenris, fighting side by side with Lord Beric as his wolf guard. Warzone after warzone, he was there, the space wolf who knew when to be the soldier, the politician, and the Fenrisian. As a leader, he began to craft his own way of war, favoring the use of drop pod assaults, hitting hard and fast, then retreating back to allied lines. Ragnar allowed his warriors the good death they craved, but never put them in situations where it was pointless. It was decades of brutal conflict and wars within the Imperium when the terrible news came to him. Lord Beric had been slain. Rage gripped Ragnar, but not the hot-blooded sensation he had been a slave to before. It was cold, tempered anger that had the hallmarks of wisdom of past mistakes. Gathering the remnants of Lord Beric's company, Ragnar led the host directly to the corrupted Chaos Champion, and in a mind-numbingly brutal duel he slayed the traitor, avenging his mentor. The great company was leaderless, and when the time came, there was only one clear choice. Even the veterans, centuries old, acquiesced to the man who they had seen prove himself a hundred times over as the youngest ever in the history of the chapter, Ragnar ascended. Wolf Lord Ragnar Blackmane. Renaming the great company to the Black Manes, the young king would lead his wolves across the various war zones in the Imperium. The Xenos, the Mutant, and the Heretic all fell to the Black Manes and his Frost Fang. Even at the end of the 41st millennium, Ragnar led his company in the besieged world of Cadia, as Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade roared out from the Eye of Terror. It would be on this beleaguered world that Ragnar would meet a face he had not seen in a long time, and put to an end a dishonor he carried in his heart. It's over, Sariel. It is far from over. This is a matter of Duelum Dolor, Jarl Blackmane. Yield or die, those are the laws that bind us here. It can only be over when one yields and offers his life to the other's blade, or one dies in the duel itself. Then yield. No. Yield and I spare your life. Never. Ragnar pressed the blade against his rival's throat, leaning closer. His breath steamed in the icy wind. Don't make me kill you! Not after four decades have passed since my sin. You lost, Soriel. It's finished. Soriel used his remaining hand to disengage the helmet seals and pull the helm free. Sweating as much as Ragnar, he stood bareheaded, 
and stern in the cold mountain air. Then kill me, for I do not yield to you, Lord of Wolves. Ragnar could scarce believe what he was hearing. Soriel was meeting the wolves' eyes now, dark to pale, a stare of stark nobility meeting a gaze of all too feral fury. He kept his halved arm held against his tabard, the wound had already sealed by his enhanced physiology. It was the old anger that Ragnar felt now, creeping over his skin like a rash, settling into his skull like an infection. He felt the staring eyes of his men upon him, as well as the dark angel's eyes and the witnessing gazes of hundreds of Cadian soldiers. Watching the Imperium's finest warriors on the verge of murdering each other instead of saving this vital world, all of the fight had been bled from him, leeching all of his strength with it. Adrenaline alone kept him on his feet. There had to be a way out of this, Razor Tongue would know. The thought came unbidden, true or not. The bitter and long dead bard would also have mocked him mercilessly for getting into this position in the first place. Ragnar smiled, a crooked and sly bard smile. No, he said, and hurled the priceless Frostfrang aside, letting it sleep into the snow near Soriel's powerless blade. The Dark Angel's eyes flickered to the fallen weapons, then rested on Ragnar's once more. No? No! Ragnar repeated. We stand at the edge of the Imperium's end, brothers at each other's throats. Rossi's blood if a flesh terror played a part in saving my life. After all the bloodshed between our chapters, I'll willingly fight at your side without hatred. Can you truly not do the same? Now, of all times, when it matters most, look at the sky, Soriel. Look at this world aflame. We stand together now, or we fall apart. Soriel swallowed and said nothing. For forty years, I've carried the guilt and shame of leaving this duel unfinished, said Ragnar. We've finished it now. At long last, I've won it, Soriel. I choose how it ends, and it ends with both of our blades in the snow, not bathed in each other's blood. Yield, you proud bastard! Tend to your wounds, then fight by my side! I have warriors still trapped in the city. Help me find them, cousin. Soriel scanned the ranks of his dark armored brethren, and then watched the growling, snarling wolves for the span of exactly nine heartbeats, thinking, dwelling, deciding. I yield, he said at last. There was a pause. And we will stand with you to retake Casa Belloc. The reaction was immediate. The Dark Angel ranks drew their blades from the earth, cleaning the snow from the steel and sheathing them at once. Their solemn presence melted away, road warriors returning to their duties in ruthless order, preparing for the next battle. My brethren, said Soriel, are not celebratory souls. My brothers, ah, said Ragnar, a moment before the survivors of his great company howled to the night sky long and loud. When the shouting ceased, Soriel cleared his throat. I must see if my apothecary can graft an augmentic replacement to my arm before the next battle. We will speak again before we leave. Wait! Ragnar offered his hand, his left hand. Soriel took it, gripping it wrist to wrist, as Vorain had done upon greeting the Wolf Lord upon arrival earlier that day. My thanks, Dark Angel. For your aid in the city. Duty. Soriel replied with a brief smile. It was the first sign of amusement Ragnar had witnessed from the Dark Angel. With that, the captain walked away. Ragnar watched Soriel's retreating back. Their composure never ceases to amaze me. They're from cooler, calmer blood than you and I, admitted the flesh terror. Forty years, Ragnar murmured. Four decades of guilt washed clean in an instant. He shook his head, overwhelmed by the Dark Angel's stoic madness, yet shamelessly grateful for their part in his company's salvation. You were lucky, Black Mane. Ragnar turned to Varane, forgiving him the use of the tribal name. You believe so? Even an Axeman can judge a fight between Swordmasters, Wolf. You were lucky to weave beneath that sword that would have severed your head from your shoulders. You won a duel you should have lost. 
You beat a foe who was only seconds from killing you. I had him, Ragnar said, perfectly sincere. For Rain laughed, the sound rich and guttural. Your secret is safe with me, Blackmane. He gestured to the mountain fortress, to the grounded gunships, to the tank crews with their vehicles, to the rattle-walking sentinels marching here and there, to the dozens of flesh terrors, space wolves and dark angels in hesitant alliance, cautiously mixing ranks. Well, safe with me. And every soul who saw the only reason you dodged the killing blow was because you slipped on the ice. Ah, you lie, Flesh Terror! You lie like a fireside storyteller! At the speed you were fighting, can anyone be sure what they saw? I know what it looked like to me. Let's speak no more of it, cousin. Sons of Fenris, now is the hour of blood. Now is the time to fight. By the end of this day, every warrior among you will have a new verse to add to your sagas. In the name of Rus and the Allfather, kill them all. Wolf Lord Ragnar Blackmane. At just under a century of life, the boy from the Thunderfist tribe had changed so much. In our own lives we evolve and learn to think about how different you were a decade ago. But for Ragnar, that evolution had continued for nearly 100 years. Just as how he had looked at Astarte such as Ranek, Sergeant Hakon, and Lord Berek, the young Blood Claws looked to the legend that leads their Black Mane company. The Wolf Lord walks across many battlefields, flanked by his two Fenrisian wolves that he found injured in the frozen wastes on Fenris shortly after his ascension to Wolf Lord. Not long after his promotion, Ragnar and the Space Wolves found themselves confronted by a situation that would change the chapter forever. The return of the 13th Great Company. Remnants had been found of these ancient brothers and they were rushed to the Fang to await judgement. Their piercing yellow eyes fell over the warriors, who had learned to fear the inner beast. They were sane, loyal sons of Rus, but they were also Wolfen. Not like the fell creatures, but still changed. Logan Grimnar and his wolf lords debated over what to do, but it would be Ragnar who broke the deadlock decrying to his brothers that the members of the 13th spread across the stars should be recovered. He had sat beside the fire with them, spoke of Lehman Rust, the man with them. He had seen their humanity. The great companies were loosed upon the stars. Ragnar and his brothers were set out to save their brethren. It was decades of an uneasy balance of fighting the enemies of the Imperium and looking for their ancient brothers. It was then that the dire news came of Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade. It was a brutal conflict. Many of the wolves under Ragnar's command made their glorious end. But again, he did not waste their lives, never giving up hope that they would fight their way to safety. And the hundreds of wolves that followed him inspired by his bravery, reassured by his cunning jests and witty banter. But all of the wolves and defenders of Cadia's sacrifice had not been enough, as the planet was cracked open, destroyed by chaos. An enormous warp rift tore across the galaxy, splitting the Imperium in two. Ragnar and his depleted company managed to evacuate off the planet piece of it cracking off as it was consumed in fire. The wolves and the Imperium were facing the most dangerous moment since the Horus Heresy, but Ragnar did not waver. In a move that would never have been done by his mentor Berek, he began to spread his company wide. He understood that to the various worlds under assault, it was important to see them. The wolves were a symbol of defiance, a point in which humanity could rally behind. Ragnar and the Black Mane Company were stuck in a constant day-to-day -day struggle to keep the Imperium from falling. There was no rest for the young king. 
as Frostfang became slick with corrupted and alien blood. After a near endless cycle of battle, Ragnar discovered a massive orc war that was rampaging across the sector. Gathering the Black Main Great Company together, Ragnar headed towards the foul Xenos. Gazkul, Mag, Uruk, Thraka. An enormous orc warboss had been cutting a path of slaughter, leaving millions of dead in his wake. Descending to the world of Krognar, the wolves attacked, both sides suffering heavy casualties. As the battle raged on, Ragnar became separated from his pack, finding himself trapped inside a cathedral. An enormous silhouette emerged from the shadows. Gazkul. The first Xenos Ragnar had ever slain was an orc, and if it was to be his last, then so be it. The duel began. The ferocious barbarian versus the brutal Xenos. Ragnar fought with everything he had, a century of warfare behind each swing. The two were wounded, but evenly matched, until Gazkul grabbed Ragnar with his enormous hydraulic claw and began to squeeze. Feeling his organs begin to compress, his armor splitting, Ragnar, with the last of his strength, drew back Frostfang and severed the beast's head. Stumbling out of the cathedral, the young king raised the Xenos' severed head and howled in glory, and then he collapsed to the ground. Ragnar, just like Hakon before him, entered the Red Dream, dying slowly. The primitive boy who had learned so much, who could have been so much more, was about to have his name added to the glorious dead, ready for the sagas to be sung. Holding their lord's broken body, the Black Manes found aid. The Indomitus Crusade, Primarch Rabute Gilliman, son of the Allfather, had returned. With them came a new form of space marine, the Primaris. Tech priests under the tutelage of the legendary Belisarius Call offered to attempt to save Ragnar. His survival lay on crossing the Rubicon Primaris. The battered body of Ragnar again lay on that cold steel table. He was cut open. New organs were placed inside. Ragnar had carried the torch of many. Ranek, Kjell, Lars, Nils, Kara, Hakon, Sven, Hagar, Gabriella, Torin, Nalfir, Beric, and his black manes. He was not ready to join the halls of Rus, because as long as he remained, the galaxy would yet know hope. Ragnar Blackmane emerged. He had survived. Stronger, faster, and tougher than his brother Wolves. The young king has risen, reinvigorated, ready to challenge the enemies of the All-Father. The soldier, the politician, the Fenrisian, and the Wolf Lord. Ragnar, long live the Black Wolf of Rus. It matters not how high your walls soar. It matters not how many will answer your call. It matters not how keen your blade glimmers, nor how bright burns your hearth fire. The wolf waits. The wolf waits in darkness for us all. We are the wolf that stalks the cold skies and swallows the star fire. We are the hidden in the darkness when the light has gone. Our light is within us. We run the ruin of fire in the darkness. Foes burn in our passing. Thank you.